All right, good afternoon. And welcome to the White House. Uh, my name is Gautam Raghavan, and I have the honor of serving here in the White House Office of Public Engagement as liaison to the LGBT community, as well as the Asian American Pacific Islander community. And it is truly an honor to work for a president who has done so much to advance equality for all Americans. And it is an honor to be here today for this very special occasion. When President Obama posthumously awarded Harvey Milk the Medal of Honor in 2009, he said that Harvey's, quote, message of hope, hope unashamed, hope unafraid, could not ever be silenced, end quote. Hope has galvanized our movement, our LGBT movement, our community, our family for decades. From the Stonewall riots to the first marches in Washington, from Frank Kameny to Bayard Rustin, to the countless activists whose names we've forgotten or whose names have been erased, from PFLAG moms to young dreamers, and every year without fail, in pride parades across the country and increasingly across the world. On the streets of the Castro, Harvey Milk envisioned a future in which LGBT individuals are treated with dignity and equality. And we know that that vision did not end at our nation's borders. So today we celebrate Harvey's birthday. He would have been 84 years old. I wish he could have gone old and seen the legacy of the hope he breathed into so many of our lives. And I think he would have liked being on a stamp because he knew that the best way to change hearts and minds was for people to get to know us. So stamps are a way of capturing our history, to celebrate our heroes, to remember the progress we've made as a nation. And today, we install Harvey Milk into that tiny corner of an envelope where the giants of history reside. And as we do so, let's celebrate and recommit ourselves to a message that continues to fuel our march towards a more perfect union and a more perfect world, Harvey Milk's message of hope. We're here because Harvey Milk hoped us into existence. So now I'm excited to introduce to you a woman whose, no, whose voice I know will be familiar to many of you. The first time I heard Same Love on the radio, I cried. I'm not ashamed to admit it. And I still get chills every time I hear Mary Lambert sing, I can't change, even if I tried, even if I wanted to. So joining us from one of the greatest cities in one of the greatest states of the country, that's my hometown of Seattle, Washington, <laughs> Please join me in welcoming Grammy-nominated singer-songwriter, Mary Lambert. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proud we hail at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight o'er the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in the air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there oh see does that star spangled banner yet We are joined today by a number of distinguished guests, and I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge them. Um, first, the United States Postal Service and the Harvey Milk Foundation are partners in today's event, and the staff and volunteers from both organizations who worked tirelessly to put this event together. So please give them a round of applause. <clears throat> I also want to recognize two incredible community leaders who are here in this audience. Uh, first, the Honorable Nicole Mari Ramirez, who serves as San Diego City Commissioner and as Executive Director of the International Imperial Court System. Nicole, please. Uh, 
Uh, I heard Nicole first met Harvey Milk in the 1970s and has been working hard to keep his legacy alive ever since. Because of, because of Nicole's leadership, communities around this country mobilized to raise awareness of the importance of a Harvey Milk stamp. So thank you for your leadership. And I also want to acknowledge Ray Carey, uh, Executive Director of the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force. <laughs> the task force lent its national weight and grassroots support to this effort as well. So thank you, Ray, and the task force for all that you do. We're also joined by a number of uh, members of Congress, and so I'd like to invite them to stand and be recognized. First, of course, House Democratic Leader Nancy Pelosi. <laughs> The first, but certainly not the last, openly gay person to serve the United States Senate, Tammy Baldwin. <laughs> An icon and champion for civil rights of all Americans, Congressman John Lewis. <laughs> A dear friend and ally to our community, Congresswoman Debbie Wasserman Schultz. And two co-chairs of the Congressional LGBT Caucus, Congressman Mark Pocan and Congressman uh, Mark Takano. There is perhaps no greater, greater tribute to Harvey Milk's legacy than the number of openly LGBT elected and appointed officials here in the audience, including a number of my colleagues from across the Obama administration. So I'd like to ask all of the elected and, and appointed officials here to stand as a group and be recognized. Please, don't be shy. And I also want to introduce to you and acknowledge a group of students who are here from Harvey Milk High School in New York City, along with staff of the Hetrick Martin Institute. If you haven't had a chance to meet uh, or visit Harvey Milk High School, I hope you'll introduce yourself to these students. I know you'll be inspired by their courage, their passion, and their strength. So we're so glad you could all be with us today. Thank you for coming. And finally, I want to acknowledge the family members of Harvey Milk who are with us here today. So please, if you wish to stand or be recognized, uh, we'd like to give you a round of applause. <laughs> Among these family members is Harvey's nephew, Stuart Milk. For those of you who've worked with Stuart Milk, you know that whenever you email or call him, he's in a different city around the world which is surely a testament to his energy and passion for his work. Stuart was just 17 years old when his uncle was assassinated, but he has worked diligently and tirelessly to preserve Harvey Milk's legacy and spread his message of hope. So please join me in welcoming to the podium Harvey Milk's nephew and the co-founder of the Harvey Milk Foundation, Stuart Milk. Thank you so much, everyone, uh, for c coming here, being here today. Um, I just wanted to do um, just some additional thank yous before I go into um, some remarks. Um, I, I wanted to piggyback on what Gottenham said in terms of this, um, the, the Harvey Milk stamp, the partnership with the post office, which has been, um, which has been something that uh, Milk Foundation volunteers have been working with them for two years now um, when they made the decision to go ahead and move with the stamp. And um, I also have to really give a huge shout out to the leadership and the vision behind the stamp, which was the international court system. So uh, n not only is Nicole Murray Ramirez a uh, city commissioner in San Diego, but he's really the vision behind what the international court system has done. And, uh, and I also have to thank all of the partners behind that campaign, which included the task force and um, the Victory Fund and Equality California. There's a large contingent from Equality California here, and I just wanted to point that out. Maybe we can just give them a round of applause as well. Um, I can't tell you how much, uh, this is the second year in a row on May 22nd I'm here and um, at this podium with Gottenham and, and the OPE crew. And so I really have to say that Valerie Jarrett and her team and the work that they do at OPE is amazing. And I can't t tell you how much these type of events mean. And, 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 I, and I thank all of the OPE team for, for the work that you continue to do. My uncle, Uncle Harvey didn't set out 
to have a postage stamp named for him. In fact, he did not set out to be a martyr. Yet at some point he knew he had to be a first, a first to call on all to come out, a first to be so loud and proud and authentic, his authentic self, even when society had a message 40 years ago that said, we will not accept you. His message was authenticity. And much like MLK, Martin Luther King, Uncle Harvey had a dream for which he knew he would not physically get to see come real. Um, and I'm often asked if the family has regrets that Harvey didn't get to see a day like today. We were just talking about would he have celebrated it. But he did see this day because he dreamed it. It is what gave him the strength to go into work with death threats and to be, remain loud and remain with that call that we have to come out. Uncle, Harvey let, Harvey, Uncle Harvey's message let these bullets that smashed through my brain smash through every mask of implanticity, every closet door in which we could hide our true self. Let these bullets smash the lies, the myths, the distortions of who we are, not just the myths of LGBT people, but people of color, of immigrants, of women, of those with disabilities, of those with religious beliefs and non-beliefs that are different than ours. It was a hope that those bullets would destroy the false premise that we are somehow weakened by diversity. And he realized that his assassination would have a second round of shots that were fired 35 years ago yesterday, which marked the anniversary of a jury that wept not for my uncle, not for George Moscone, but 35 years ago, a jury wept for a cold-blooded assassin and returned ver verdicts of not guilty to murder. This was also a prophetic vision that Uncle Harvey had that would pull back the curtain of societal injustice and society-wide diminishment. That hate-inspired verdict, not, not guilty of murder, was the second round of bullets fired, causing a tremor and a wake-up call to the reality that legal inequality, lack of justice, and denial of the most basic of human rights is un-American. I know Uncle Harvey hoped the harshness of such a jury verdict with its meanness, its de de dehumanization, its saying it's okay to kill a gay man and his ally in San Francisco. It was a message that said, if you look like us, if you, do, if you don't look like us, if you don't believe like us, if you don't love like us, then we don't value your life and justice will not apply to you. We would, it was a wake up call and I think today we can say we've heard it. It was truly Uncle Harvey's dream that we could see a different paradigm resulting from both his assassination and that equally mean spirited verdict. He hoped our justice system could be moved to not only uphold the rights of LGBT people, but to live free from violence and scorn, and maybe our justice system could even uphold the equality principles of our Constitution. Harvey often said, no matter how hard you try, you cannot erase these wor words. We are all equal with inalienable rights. He dreamed of the day that not only brave men and women would run and get elected as openly LGBT officials like Tammy Baldwin, like Evan Lowe, like Robert Garcia. He dreamed of fierce allies like George Moscone, who would stand up and not waver from his LGBT brothers and sisters. Like John Lewis, who I had the honor to, to, to be with in, in the South, in Atlanta, whose thunder for equality, and you're going to hear that today, his thunder for equality that's fully inclusive was a beacon of light that continues to shine today. Leaders and allies like Nancy Pelosi, who has led LGBT inclusion for as long as we can remember, but who has semantics down cold. And this is important. You will never hear <coughs> Leader Pelosi talking about tolerance. She talks about celebration, inclusion, and the respect that we have for each other. She does not simply want the uh, American citizens to be tolerated. She wants us all to be included. That message has gone on. And the unparalleled embrace that we have gotten from President Obama and this administration, unparalleled support of a sitting president whose entire administration has set new heights of fierce advocacy on LGBT inclusiveness, human rights both here and abroad. 
We have so many here in this room who would follow in the footsteps of authenticity, people simply living their lives with self-acceptance, unwilling to hide who they are and who they love. My uncle also dreamed of heroes, unafraid and unashamed of who they are and who they love, like Edith Windsor, whose historic Supreme Court victory is not even a year old. Can you imagine that? It's not even a year old. And it's turning marriage equality into seemingly weekly victories in federal courts throughout our nation. It's historic times we're living in. We have cultural heroes like Mary Lambert, who will get up in a worldwide audience on the Grammys and with Madonna and Queen Lativa marry couples that included LGBT couples and sing, <coughs> beam out, I'm not crying on Sundays. I will not allow the messages that I heard when I was young on Sunday to interfere with me. I am not crying on Sundays. I will not change, even if I could. Powerful, cultural changing words. Heroes like Michael Sam, who are unafraid to be a first and follow that up with a same-sex kiss that ESPN will probably not soon forget. <laughs> and my uncle dreamed of the day that when we would have everyday heroes changing the hearts and soul of humanity. These are young people, like we have here in the audience from Heydrich Martin in New York. These are young people having those difficult kitchen table conversations. They don't get easier, they're difficult, but they are having them and they are changing hearts and minds. Young people who are standing up for themselves in schoolyards and in lunchroom cafeterias, and not only standing up for themselves, but embracing other people who are different. Employees who still have to make that challenging decision whether they're gonna be out at work and be authentic. These are, these are everyday heroes that are the component of where we have moved today. This was my uncle's core message, that we must come out, we must be visible. That is what has changed. It took 35 years, but he dreamed that. He saw that. That is why he took those bullets. Now, we do have some amazing moments in history that's the best of times in the West. And as Gottenham said, we spend a lot of time, the Milk Foundation folks abroad. And unfortunately, as far as we have moved forward in the last year, in the last two years, in the last three years, last year at this time, one-sixth of the world's population, one out of every six people have gone backwards. They have now been recriminalized. Their very existence is now illegal just because of who they love, just because of who they are. We cannot allow the backwards march in Asia, in Africa, and Eastern Europe. We can't allow it. The Milk Foundation has had the honor to stand on the ground with amazing advocates from these countries. We have some of them here with us today. These, the Milk Foundation is all volunteer. And we have, uh, we have volunteers from Eastern Europe, from Scandinavia, from uh, uh, Italy. Um, these are all young people, people who, who have stood with me in very difficult situations. So whether I was pelted with eggs or, 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 or covered with urine, these are young people who I go in and go out. They stay in these situations every day and they continue to fight. We also have elected officials here with us today who followed in my uncle's footsteps. Um, we have, uh, and, and they serve on the Harvey Milk Foundation board and they're, they're shining some very, very bright lights. And we have allies from abroad, um, from my uncle's homeland in Lithuania who are with us today, where hopefully the recognition of one of their most fav fa famous Lithuanian Americans, Harvey Milk, will start to spread even more light in that country. You know, Ann and I started the foundation um, when Desmond Tutu, five years ago, right here at the White House, challenged us to do more. That we had to, that we have a martyr, someone who died for other people, we need to use that name to do more. And so we started the, the Milk Foundation, and I wanted to close with a quote with, with our global perspective. I go back to 1985 and the closing conference of the UN Decade on Women to a small aboriginal leader named Lilla Watson who stood at a podium of people who wanted to do good in the world, people who wanted to help women 
to help minorities, to help Lilla. And she stood at that podium and she said, if you have come here because you want to help me, we have nothing to talk about. Go home. And you could have heard a pin drop in that room. But she said, but if you have come here because you understand that my liberation is bound with yours, then let us work together. That is the light. That is the call of us working together. There is a self-interest that we should all have in equality in the world. There is a self-interest that we should all have that there are people that are still struggling to be free. It's critically important. This stamp sends that message. Harvey Milk and all of his light, his call for authenticity, his setting a bar above simply being tolerated. Harvey Milk has come to represent much more than a man. He's come to re represent a universal beacon that powerfully transcends language, continents, and cultures. My uncle today represents the us's, his famous us's. You and me and all that are still not free. Harvey Milk has become a forever stamp indeed for the true fare, the true price of that has been paid by his life so that we can all use that image born out of bullets but carried forward by each of us, everyone who runs openly for public office, everyone who refuses to put on a mask, everyone who asks and tells every young person who has that forever hard and challenging kitchen table conversation. Hearts and minds are changed. This forever stamp now rides on top of a man who not only believed we could change the world, he believed each and every person in this room has the extraordinary ability to affect history without exception, that we continue this struggle without him but without the need for bullets. Hope is truly not silent today and we have this beautiful stamp to remind us that, we, that hope resides in you, hope resides in me. As President Obama said about Harvey, hope unashamed, hope unafraid. Thank you. It's a great honor for me to, to, to move into, um, uh, into that global view to be able to talk about um, our next um, speaker. Uh, Ambassador Samantha Power is one of those people who human rights is born in her blood. Um, if you had read any of her books, she won a Pulitzer Prize because of the passion and because of, of what she experienced and saw. You, you don't become a journalist and cover the hardest human rights struggles in the world without it being deep in your heart, being in your blood, that you want people to be free. She said, we all have a stake in this. When laws such as those proposed in Uganda strip away the right of life, privacy, and freedom of expression and association for the LGBT community, everyone's fundamental freedoms are threatened. As we move forward with this work, we stand in solidarity with many brave LGBT activists around the world, from Albania to Zimbabwe, who put their lives in the line every day. We are inspired, we are listening, and let me tell you that our diplomatic corps has been the, one of the most, most life-affirming group of people to work with. They have set the bar high, and I don't think we could have a more impassioned advocate and fierce leader at the United Nations than Ambassador Samantha Power. Totally humbled to be among you. Uh, look out at the audience, and uh, you are the people who have worked uh, to create so much progress. I'm truly, truly moved uh, to be here today. I work for a president. I get to work for a president who is identified with two words, hope and change. But it's hard to think of words that more succinctly describe Harvey Milk, the leader, the activist, the fighter, the elected official. Hope and change is about a deeply held and proud American tradition, a tradition of toil to ensure the triumph of progress, a tradition of love winning out over fear. Hope and change. Congressman John Lewis knows something about hope, and he knows something about change. He did not imagine an America where black people could just sit at the same lunch counter. 
He envisaged an America where black people could lead in our Congress and indeed lead the country. And he went out and fought like hell to make it happen. That is change. Senator Tammy Baldwin knows something about hope and change. She wanted to be a United States Senator. She didn't care that there had never been an out LGBT person elected to the US Senate. In her own words, she didn't run to make history, she ran to make a difference. But thanks to her, no young person will ever have to wonder whether a gay person can be elected to the Senate. They have Tammy Baldwin. We have Tammy Baldwin. That is change. And the intrepid leader, Nancy Pelosi, knows something about hope and change. She envisaged, en envisaged an America where people had access to quality, affordable health care, and where brave men and women can fight for the country they love, regardless of who they love. And with President Obama, she made that happen. That is change. <laughs> Hope is about envisioning a world where it is simply not OK to execute people on the basis of their sexual orientation, as is legal in seven countries. Change is about ensuring that homophobic countries who seek to eliminate sexual orientation from the United Nations resolution on extrajudicial executions fail. And thanks to President Obama's leadership, they have. Hope is about envisioning a world where LGBT persons have a seat at the table. Change is about ensuring that organizations dedicated to advancing LGBT rights enjoy the same privileges and accreditations at the United Nations as any other organization. And thanks to President Obama's leadership, they now do. Hope is about envisioning a global consensus that LGBT rights are human rights, and human rights are LGBT rights. Change is about passing the first UN resolution in history that recognizes that. And under President Obama, we have. Hope is about envisioning a world where promoting LGBT rights is a central part of our foreign policy. Change is about the President of the United States directing his entire government to do just that, and he has. Hope is about envisioning a world where leaders do not target their most vulnerable citizens with laws that criminalize their existence, as is true now in 76 countries around the world, including Nigeria and Uganda, where new legislation further targeting LGBT individuals was signed into law earlier this year. Change is about standing up to them when they do. And under President Obama, we have. Hope and change is about envis envisioning a world that is fairer, kinder, more just, not just for some people, but for all people. Hope and change is about being more like John Lewis, more like Tammy Baldwin, more like Nancy Pelosi, and more like Harvey Milk. Today, each of us has come to the White House to honor a man who refused to accept anything short of equality. He was impatient with excuses. He was intolerant of injustice. He demanded dignity for himself and for all Americans. In so doing, he helped to make America more fair, more just, and more equal. In short, Harvey Milk made America more American. There will always be the cynics among us who mock the power of hope and the promise of change. Hope will never be silent, Harvey Milk told them, and his legacy is a reminder that hope is never to be mocked. For the millions of gay people in this country who can now choose to serve their country openly and proudly, hope and change has real meaning. For the millions of gay people in this country who can now enjoy the same federal benefits as their straight colleagues, hope and change has real meaning. For the millions of, peop of young people in this country who for the first time have leaders committed to ending bullying rather than seeking to codify inequality in the Constitution, hope and change has real meaning. Hope and change is not a campaign slogan. It is a call to action, a call that Harvey Milk embodied, a cause he died for, and a crusade that we all must pledge to carry on. But in our celebration and pride about how far we have come as we unveil stamps commemorating those who made this possible, we cannot lose sight of how far we have yet to go. While we now do live in an age where the National Football League has, for the first time, drafted an openly gay man, 
We still live in an age where the NFL can fire him for being gay. Postage stamps will not change that. Legislation will. Supervisor Milk liked to begin his speeches by saying, my name is Harvey Milk and I am here to recruit you. For those who raise your voices in the face of intolerance, who speak up for equality, who fight for the vulnerable, you are continuing the work of a great American, an American we honor today with a stamp, but whose work will forever live in the freedoms he helped protect, the equality he helped advance, the constitutional principles and promise he helped render real for all Americans, not just some. Harvey Milk, you have recruited us, and we will be forever grateful, and we will be forever changed. Thank you. In 1996, when the House of Representatives took up the so-called Defense of Marriage Act, Congressman John Lewis stood in opposition. 17 years before the Supreme Court weighed in, Congressman Lewis called DOMA, quote, a mean bill, cruel, a slap in the face of the Declaration of Independence. In his words, I fought too long and too hard to end discrimination based on race and color to not stand up against discrimination against our gay and lesbian brothers and sisters. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me welcoming to the podium Congressman John Lewis. I'm proud that this nation will honor the legacy of this brave and courageous man, Harvey Milk, who gave his life in the struggle against hate and discrimination in this country, in our beloved country. The activism of Harvey Milk came of age during the last social revolution in American history. It was a revolution of values and ideas that started in 1955 in the American South and gave rise to other movement of conscience in America. Good trouble, necessary trouble. That's what Harvey Milk got involved in. Students sat in and sat down against the Vietnam War some places in America, women, young, middle-aged, and some older women, burn their bras <laughs> to proclaim their liberation as African American, they had changed for civil rights and social justice all over America. It was numberless diverse acts of courage, belief that human history is shaped. It was during this climate a rapid transformation that Robert F. Kennedy spoke those words. He continued each time a man stand up for an idea, an act to improve the lots of others, a strike out against injustice, he sends forth a tiny rip of hope. And those rippers build a current which can sweep down the mightiest walls of oppression and resistance. Harvey Milk was inspired by words like these and the activism of others. So he decided to send out another ripple of hope in the ongoing human struggle for freedom. Nancy Pelosi on Castro Street, in your beautiful city in San Francisco in the early 1970s. He began to stand up and speak out for justice and demand respect for human dignity of gay, straight, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender people. He was brave, brave, bold, courageous. He challenged the city government and ultimately the nation to 
build a more fair or more just society? He said it doesn't matter whether someone is gay or straight, lesbian, bisexual, or transgender. We all aspire of the divine. No one should have to live in the shadow because of how they are created. Every human being, regardless of their difference, has the right to be free, just to be free. Harvey Milk and the men and women who followed him struggled to break down the barriers based on race, gender, class, and sexual orientation. And last year, just last year, just a few months ago, the tiny rips, these tiny rippers, began more than 40 years ago, became a tidal wave that swept through the Supreme Court and the nation. Liberating gay couples in states around the country almost every single day, almost every single week, almost every single month, another wall came tumbling down. So thank you, Harvey Milk. It was because of the rippers that Harvey Milk sent forth that Matthew Shepard and James Byrd Jr. Hate Crime Prevention Act was signed into law. It was because of Harvey Milk that there are strong congressional efforts to protect GLBT workers and bring down barriers in adoption and foster care. All of this progress, my beloved brothers and sisters, has written in the life and legacy of Harvey Milk, and we must never, ever forget it. But the struggle for equal justice is not over in America. We made a lot of progress. We come with distance, but we're not there yet. We must continue to support the vision, the dream, and the legacy of the mayor of Castor Street, Harvey Milk, until we finally accept one simple truth, that we are one people, one family, the human family. We all live in one house, the American house, the world house. With this stamp, this unbelievable stamp, we remember, we honor an unforgettable man, Harvey Milk, who gave his life in an ongoing struggle to build a nation and a world community at peace with itself. Thank you, Harvey Milk. It's a great, great honor to be able to talk about um, leaders in our country who, who break grass ceilings everywhere they walk. Um, uh, I remember, in particular, the work done on the ERA and work that I mentioned before with the UN conference, the, the UN Decade on Women, and the thought was that we were never going to get there. We were never going to have some of these ceilings broken for women. And, um, and it's been just my great honor to know one of the great ceiling breakers um, uh, uh, that we have, one of the, one of the country's treasures. Um, so uh, we have somebody who broke a ceiling that sent, I think, shockwaves around the world when uh, we had the first woman elected speaker of the United States House of Representatives, when we had the first Italian-American elected, <laughs> when we had the first Californian elected. And let me tell you <laughs> that we had the Matthew Shepard Bird human uh, hate crime law because of the leadership that we had in the House under Nancy Pelosi. We took down the discriminatory 
don't ask, don't tell law through the work of Nancy Pelosi. And even, and even the DOMA issue, Nancy Pelosi reached and led 132 Democrats to lead and file an amicus brief that at the end of the day took down that discriminatory Defense of Marriage Act. California, San Francisco, the United States and the world is so proud of this leader, Nancy Pelosi. Please join me. Thank you very much, Stuart, for your very, very generous remarks, which, will I, which I will accept on behalf of my colleagues who are here who made all of, some of those accomplishments possible. Of course, our great John Lewis, and thank you for putting after him, after me, after him on the program, right? <laughs> but he's such an inspiration to all of us. I called him yesterday, and, and his voicemail said, Keep your eye on the prize. <laughs> and indeed, you keep us very focused there, John. But I'm so honored that, uh, uh, to be here with the chair of the Democratic National Committee, Deborah Wasserman Schultz, my colleague who shares in the, uh, the uh, credit for some of our accomplishments, Debbie, and Mark Takano and uh, Mark Pocan, two Marks, co-chairs of our, gay, our task force in, in the House, new members. Uh, ever expanding our numbers there. And when, uh, 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 thank you, uh, Samantha, for mentioning uh, Tammy, but, and you talk about her in the Senate, but the fact is she was the first lesbian elected to Congress. And we in the House have great, we are very proprietary about her. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so when she came to Congress, we were so thrilled, and she was so wonderful, and, and uh, Democrats, Republicans, House, Senate, everyone uh, was thrilled and honored to serve with her. And now Mark Pecan follows in her footsteps in that great district in Wisconsin, which has been very generous uh, to America with the diversity of its leadership. Samantha, thank you for giving us the global perspective on all of this, because that's what the Harvey Milk Foundation is about, global and for uh, talking about our great president. Uh, I was thinking while you were speaking that it was four years ago today, it was on Harvey's 80th birthday. Remember, and we were, and Stuart, we were in San Francisco and we were celebrating his 80th birthday, Harvey Milk Day in California. And uh, I said in my remarks and the enthusiasm that, you know, happens in a speech, <laughs> by Christmas we will have an end to don't ask, don't tell, right? And everybody said, Nancy promised to press the next day. <laughs> Nancy promised. And I, I knew that we would do what we needed to do in the Congress to do it, but of course, uh, uh, nonetheless, and we did. But it would never have happened without President Barack Obama. He provided the leadership across the board. And So when you say, Harvey, unparalleled president in terms of gay rights and that, LBGT rights, if it weren't for the president's leadership and the views expressed by the Joint Chiefs of Staff, it would have been very hard to get the 60 votes in the Senate. We knew we would have our votes in the House. In fact, John Lewis, you remember this day, we passed, a, we passed an amendment to the, uh, the defense bill that repealed Don't Ask, Don't Tell. So we were so excited. We had a good vote, the rest of that. This was an early stage. Later, we'd have to split it off, but this was an early stage. So I went up to John and Barney Frank and Barbara Lee and all these people, and I said, today, you are making history. They said, yes, today, we passed an amendment to end, don't ask, don't tell. I said, no, today, you are making history because you are taking your first vote in favor of a defense bill. <laughs> You remember, John? Remember, John, you said, I never vote for a defense bill. <laughs> Barbara Lee, how, uh, Marty Frank, the list of progressives is a mile long. In fact, it's about 100 of them. And I said, but, but, but I can see it in the eyes of our colleagues on the other side of the aisle, not to be political. They're never going to vote for this bill. Only like seven or eight of them voted to repeal Don't Ask, Don't Tell. And I said, that's probably the extent 
of the vote we get on defense. They say, no, they always vote for the defense bill. They would never walk away from a defense bill. They always vote for the defense bill. This is what I do. <laughs> <laughs> I read minds and I can see that they're not going to be there for the defense bill. No, no, I'm never, no, never, I'm not breaking my record, all that. I said, just do me a break. Stay back and watch. And sure enough, not 10 of them voted for the defense bill. So we had this long line of progressives walking down the center aisle to vote for the defense bill. Any sacrifice was worth the repeal of Joe Nice <laughs> Thank you, John. But thank you, President Barack Obama. Without his presidency, we would not have had that success. I want that to be really clear. So anyway, he helped me keep the promise made on Harvey Milk's 80th birthday, Harvey Milk Day in San Francisco by Christmas. It would be gone, and it was. Remember, Anne, when we were at Harvey's funeral, Harvey and George's funeral on the steps of the city hall? Anne spoke that day. I kept thinking, I was thinking today on the way over here, I was thinking that day, is this how it ends? Is this how it ends? But it really was the beginning. A sad sacrifice to pay, but it was the beginning of so much. And you all know what it is, you don't need me to elaborate, but as we honor the life and legacy of a leader dedicated to the fundamental value, American value of equality. That's why, John, your remarks were so great. Because Harvey was a, a leader. He came out first. He urged others to come out. He was recruiting all of that. But he was a progressive who cared about the rights of everyone. And that's why I loved hearing your association with him. Uh, in fact, um, uh, I, I was thinking of stories when we were in picket lines for one thing or another, leafleting for one thing and another. So while his focus and what he is remembered for is about uh, his, his advocacy and his leadership and his being a pioneer in the LGBT issues and community, he was there for everyone. We recognize San Francisco for being a place where so much of this could be possible. Uh, when Stuart has said that I had my uh, semantics correct about tolerance. In San Francisco, we think tolerance is sort of a condescending word. Uh, you know, uh, we do not tolerate uh, uh, people, uh, and especially in the community, uh, we respect and we take pride. And we take pride. And we celebrate Harvey today, his courage and accomplishment in the face of really some mean-spirited things demonstrated by that jury, which was a jury not only about Harvey, but about George Moscone, who stood side by side on the um, uh, gay rights. And we commit ourselves to work, uh, continue the work that Harvey put forth. The, the day, this day represents a simple but precious, precious, precious message of progress that we have sought for years, the first LGBT leader, first LGBT leader, commemorated on a stamp. And appropriately, it is Harvey Milk. It's only the latest in a cascade of victories for the community uh, from the signal, of course, we talk about Doma in the Supreme Court, Prop 8, California, recent rulings striking down same-sex marriage uh, uh, prohibitions from Arkansas to Ar Oregon to Pennsylvania. And what have been Harvey's 84th birthday today, celebrating a stamp that bears his radiant smile, and we all know that. Um, captured by photographer Danny Nicoletta. Where are you, Danny? Danny Nicoletta. You captured him so well. <laughs> I happen to believe he sees this triumph uh, from where he is. But we know we have work to do. We have to pass ENDA, or we have to achieve marriage equality for all Americans in every state. We have to fight uh, discrimination and oppression wherever it exists in the world. And as far as uh, don't ask, don't tell, we have to make sure uh, that our men and women in uniform and their families have the full rights of every person uh, in uniform and address issues about how they were discharged from the military. And that work is never done. Our work is never done. But Harvey's uh, leadership was relentless as well. And we too must be relentless in those efforts to ensure the fundamental rights of all people, um, regardless of sexual orientation, gender identity, race, ethnicity, creed, or background. In this work, Harvey's legacy uh, continues to carry us forward. And aren't we blessed? 
and aren't you proud, Mrs. Milk, of Stuart Milk? Isn't he wonderful? Really. <laughs> We're all proud of Harvey Milk, and he did many wonderful things deserving of all of the respect and accolades uh, that he is receiving. But a real blessing to him in his life to have a nephew like Stuart Milk to carry on, to carry on, to make sure, as you said, it's all intertwined. It's all intertwined. So for so many people, for so many reasons in so many parts of the world, Stuart Milk, you are a hero. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So, whether whether um, going by the, uh, camera, uh, the camera store in the Castro or wherever, as I say, picket lines, wherever it was, with Harvey, it was uh, something we always remembered what he said when he was sworn in. When he was sworn as supervisor, he said his victory signaled a green light to all who feel disenfranchised a green light to move forward, and that the doors are opened to everyone, to everyone, John. Today, Harvey's green light still shines, still calling us forward, still calling us to the cause of compassion, justice, and opportunity for all. Thanks to Harvey, our society is better forever. Our laws forever fairer, and our democracy forever stronger. Together, we'll finish the work Harvey started and deliver on the ideals of equality that are our heritage and the hope of our nation forever. Thank you all. So now the moment you've all been waiting for. We're honored today to be joined by Ronald Stroman, the 20th Deputy Postmaster General. Deputy Postmaster General Stroman has over 30 years of experience in public service and government, including at the Department of Housing and Urban Development, Department of Transportation, the House Judiciary Committee, and Government Reform and Oversight Committee. Experience that has no doubt served him well, uh, managing one of the largest employers in the United States. And Mr. Stroman, I have a feeling after today, you're gonna see a real uptick in mail amongst LGBT folks. <laughs> so to formally dedicate the Harvey Milk Forever stamp, please join me in welcoming the Deputy Postmaster General, Ron Stroman. Thank you, Gautam. Uh, welcome, everyone. The Postal Service is proud to pay tribute to Harvey Milk, who at the time of his death was one of the emerging civil and human rights leaders for the 21st century. Now, there are a lot of reasons to admire Mr. Milk, and you've heard many of them today, beginning with his unique ability just to bring people together. It started in the early 70s when he joined forces with the Teamsters to boycott a beer company that was engaging in anti-labor and anti-gay practices. Soon, union truck drivers and LGBT people were working together, side by side, towards a common purpose. At that time, only Harvey Milk could have made such a thing possible. In the years that followed, Mr. Milk expanded his coalition to include senior citizens young people, ethnic minorities, and more. There were practical reasons for this, of course. Mr. Milk was a politician, and he knew he needed votes wherever he could find them. But he also knew that when people from different backgrounds get to know each other, they discover how much they have in common. It's the most important lesson Harvey Milk taught us. Everyone has something that makes them different. And when one group is being held down, the rest of us have a responsibility to stand up and fight back. We all have a stake in equality. That's why Harvey Milk spent so much time urging LGBT people to come out of the closet. He knew that when more straight people knew more gay people, acceptance would prevail over prejudice, unity would triumph over division, and hope would conquer fear. And more than anything else, Harvey Milk gave us hope. That's one of the reasons he ran for office in the first place. By showing the world he wasn't afraid to be himself, he gave countless others the courage 
and the pride to be who they are. And let's be clear, as you've heard from Stuart, it was difficult back then. These were dangerous times for the LGBT community, even in places like San Francisco. Gay people were subject to violence and harassment. No one understood this better than Harvey Milk. As one of the nation's first openly gay elected officials, he lived with the threat of death every day. Yet it never deterred him. In fact, as you've heard from Stewart, a year before his assassination, he said, quote, if a bullet should enter my brain, let that bullet destroy every closet door. Now, almost 40 years later, there are far fewer closet doors in America. I suspect everyone in this room knows someone who is openly gay, lesbian, bisexual, or transgender. They're our friends, our family members, our neighbors. They teach our children, care for us when we're sick, help keep us safe, deliver our mail. <laughs> and represent our interests on school boards, city council, state houses, and as you've heard, in the halls of Congress. They're part of our everyday lives, and our lives are better for it. I think about my own family. My young sons went to Woodrow Wilson High School here in the district, where they had the privilege of being and working and going to school with openly gay classmates and friends. These young people enriched the lives of my children, which enriched my life and the lives of everyone in our family. That's one of the reasons why I am very proud to stand here today and dedicate this stamp on behalf of the United States Postal Service. The stamp reflects our long-standing commitment to civil rights. Harvey Milk joins other civil rights pioneers who've been honored with stamps, including Martin Luther King Jr. and Cesar Chavez. And as you'll see in a moment, the Harvey Milk stamp features a black and white image of him in front of his Castro Street camera store in San Francisco. The picture was taken, as Democratic leader Pelosi said, by Dan Nicoletta for Milk's 1977 campaign. But it was rejected because his tie was blowing in the wind. Well, much like Mr. Milk himself, the picture has taken on new meaning. Today, it's considered one of his most iconic images. And so today, my Postal Service colleagues and I are eager to share this image with the rest of the world. Let it serve as a small but powerful reminder of the lessons Mr. Milk taught us, beginning with the idea that when you are not afraid to be yourself and give others the courage to take pride in who they are, it can change the world. Let this stamp also remind us of the fundamental truth behind Mr. Milk's message that we all have a stake in equality, as you've heard from John Lewis. And let it do something else. Let this forever stamp inspire a new generation to continue Harvey Milk's legacy, to keep working together towards a world where prejudice gives way to acceptance, where division gives way to unity, and where fear gives way to hope. Thank you all very much. And with that, I'm going to ask all of the speakers to come and join me as we unveil the stamp.
case you were wondering what was behind the blue drape, now you know. <laughs> Uh, Campbell City Council member Evan Lowe's career uh, includes a lot of firsts. In 2006, he became the first Asian American council member in the city of Campbell, California. Three years later, when his colleagues selected him as mayor of Campbell, he became the youngest openly gay mayor in the nation, as well as the youngest Asian American mayor in the nation. He recently stepped down as mayor of Campbell, but continues to serve on the city council. So please join me in welcoming Campbell City, Ca Campbell city Council member Evan Lowe. <laughs> Isn't this absolutely beautiful? Yeah. I come from Silicon Valley in which we are very savvy with text messages and we usually don't send out mail anymore, but I have this sudden urge to send out a bunch of mail now. Yes, send it out. We're gonna promote paper cuts, yes. Uh, but it's uh, truly an honor to be here. Uh, I often ask myself, uh, what am I doing here? And that is the same sentiment that I had when I was elected to the city council. When I ran for office, people said, you're too young, not enough experience. People said, we want American interests, not Chinese interests. People said, we don't want the homosexual agenda in our community. And of course, when we think about being young and the talent of Silicon Valley and about the innovation and bringing new ideas. That's what's critically important about the investment, not only in the future, but also in the present. And when it comes down to being of Chinese descent, I'm fourth generation Californian speaking more Spanish than I do Chinese. <laughs> but yet I was seen as a perpetual foreigner. And when I served as mayor for the city of Campbell in 2010, there were some leadership challenges that I faced. And the challenges of the fact that as mayor of city, I could officiate a wedding, marry two people, but I couldn't get married myself. The challenge that when the Red Cross asked me as mayor to host a blood drive on City Hall property, I can host a blood drive, but as a gay man, I cannot donate blood. The challenge when the Boy Scouts come and visit to earn their merit badge, and one of the boys says, Mr. Mayor, were you also in Boy Scouts? Is that how you became mayor? Karen's, the parents' eyes were. <laughs> One of the moms said, please. <laughs> Don't go there. I said, it's a complicated issue. Go ask your mom. <laughs> but these are the real stories as to why it's important to have openly gay elected officials and the message that not only Harvey Milk represents, but the work that Stuart Milk and so many of us work to ensure that we educate the public, that we Look at the stamp now. And when you have individuals in our community saying, who is Harvey Milk? We pause. And it allows us an opportunity to talk about the struggles of our communities so that the generations that are present don't get complacent. Sure, we have major quality. So what's the big deal? Yes, you can be in Boy Scouts if you're 18 and younger. But what's the big deal? This is a true representation of why it's important that we continue upon the work of Harvey Milk. I'm a beneficiary of the work of Harvey Milk. And thanks to people like Stuart Milk and all of the allies that are here, whether it be the first woman speaker in the United States, whether it be the first lesbian in the House of Representatives and in the Senate, or my personal favorite with our first openly gay Asian Pacific Islander member of Congress, <laughs> Mark Takano. You are all continuing to build upon the work that Harvey Milk did, and you create an opportunity for people like myself so we can have real conversations with people about the importance of being out, being gay, and doing what's right. For all of the elected officials and government officials, we don't have gay potholes, straight street signs. We are committed to working for everybody, the benefit for all people, and as openly gay officials, we reflect and represent the best of our communities, that we are here just like everybody else. We are human beings just like everybody else, and that we have much to contribute just like everybody else. And that is exactly the calling that Harvey Milk is asking us to do. That is exactly what this stamp is all about. So we are here 
continuing on the prospect of ensuring that we continue on the work that so many people have sacrificed for people like myself and the people that come behind me. So we must reinforce our commitment. Will you join me in the affirmation and thanking Stuart Milk and recommitting to full equality? Will you join Stuart Milk in ensuring that we break down those barriers and join us in opening up those closet doors? So important for us to continue on this momentum. And for all of the other local officials, pass resolutions in support of Harvey Milk Day. Allow for the dialogue and the conversation to occur. And lastly, because I come from Silicon Valley, don't forget to hashtag Harvey Milk Stamp. <laughs> it's a really important key factor so that we can have the broad conversations for not only the people that are not here in this room, but the people that are watching us here. So to Stuart, I start off by saying, what am I doing here? I am answering that calling that Harvey Milk has put out for all of us, and the calling and the work that you continue to do that make it possible for me to stand here before you and not feel threatened or fearful of my life, and that we have wonderful allies in our community who are leading us as world leaders in this global stage, and we will continue on the work that you do. So on behalf of all of us here and the future and the present, Stuart, thank you so very much for your commitment to true equality and building bridges and collaboration for all of us. We are so indebtful and grateful for the work that you do. Now, we can't do this all alone, and it takes important organizations and people to continue to build upon the momentum so that when I leave office, there will be more openly gay individuals in the city of Campbell, located in Silicon Valley. Come visit out here. In which the city current mayor is openly gay. It's organizations like the Victory Fund that I have the pleasure of serving on the board of that continues to mentor and recruit, identify, give the skills necessary for individuals to run for office. We are joined here today by Tori Carter, who is the COO of the Victory Fund. So please join me in welcoming a tremendous leader and a tremendous organization that builds upon the partnership of Stuart Milk and the Harvey Milk Foundation, Tori Carter of the Victory Fund. Wow. Speaking of wondering how you got here, uh, I'm incredibly honored to be on this stage. Um, on behalf of the Victory Institute board and staff, and the LGBT public officials we serve. I want to say thank you to the Harvey Milk Foundation and the Milk family for asking Victory to be a part of this historic and happy day. Every day that my colleagues and I come into work, we pass a framed picture of Harvey Milk. The same iconic photo you see on this stamp, a generous gift from the photographer, Dan Nicoletta. That photo energizes our team and it reminds us of Harvey's call. We have to elect gay people, he said, so that we have hope for a better world and a better tomorrow. Unlike some other revolutionaries, Harvey's was not a call to arms. It was a call to public service, a call to be visible where too many of us are not, a call to be brave in the face of hatred and anger, a call to be ourselves always and everywhere. 37 years after he was first elected, that call is being answered by LGBT people around the world. Harvey was just the fifth openly gay or lesbian candidate elected to office in the United States. Since then, thousands have been elected, and today more than 1,000 lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender public officials are serving at all levels of government in America, from school boards to the United States Senate in both appointed and elected positions. But Harvey's ex example is an inspiration not just in America. This month in Serbia, LGBT leaders from across the, across the Balkans are being trained by the Victory Institute to become involved in their own communities as elected officials. We're also holding trainings in Peru and Colombia. 
We're doing this work in partnership with the U.S. Agency for International Development. And that's only possible because of this administration's strong support for LGBT equality around the globe. We, com we commend the president not only for his words, but for his actions in making our country a, a leader in the pursuit for human rights for LGBT people. As Stuart Milk travels around the world on behalf of the Harvey Milk Foundation, he's meeting young people who see public service as an important part of the struggle to be accepted for who they are. They see themselves, their whole selves, their authentic selves, as part of the solution. And that's incredibly exciting. Recognizing Harvey Milk on a US postage stamp is a true milestone for his legacy, for his family, for those who fought by his side, and for those who follow in his footsteps, both here and abroad. Victory is proud to answer Harvey Milk's call. We are honored to be with his family to help celebrate this day, and we are humbled to serve the leaders he inspired. And now I have the distinct privilege of introducing one of those leaders. She was, the first, elect she was first elected to local office in Wisconsin, less than a decade after Harvey Milk's historic victory. And her passion for public service has grown stronger ever since. As a county supervisor, then a state legislator, she distinguished herself by speaking out on behalf of people whose voices were, were not being heard. The example she set as an out lesbian working to make her community better proved Harvey Milk right. We can change hearts and minds when we bring our entire selves to the work we do, when we serve openly and honestly, and when we confront fear with authenticity. In 1998, she became the first openly LGBT candidate to win election to Congress as a non-incumbent. And of course, in 2012, she made history again by becoming the first lesbian LGBT American to win elections to the United States Senate. Today, she is the highest ranking openly LGBT public official in America. And she is still speaking up and speaking out for those of us who need a champion in the federal government. Please help me welcome someone who answered Harvey Milk's call, our US Senator, Tammy Baldwin. Thank you. So I just have to say it's an extraordinary honor to be here with all of you pathmakers at this extraordinary moment. And I want to get right into Harvey Milk. Harvey Milk liked to quote the Declaration of Independence. All men are created equal and declare that no matter how hard they tried, the forces of bigotry could never erase that famous promise. What he didn't say, but instead what he proved over the course of his entire life, is that it's up to the forces of progress to keep that promise and to make it something more than just words on a page. On that front, Harvey did as much as anyone. Standing here as a United States Senator and a lesbian, it's incredible to look back upon a time when running for San Francisco supervisor as an openly gay man seemed like a revolutionary act. And Harvey knew that. He welcomed the attention, he weathered the insults, he shrugged off the death threats. And it wasn't to satisfy his own ambition, but rather to answer the call he felt to move the cause of equality forward. He ran for office so that others wouldn't have to run from who they were. He spoke out so that others wouldn't feel compelled to live in silence. In his most famous speech, he talked about young gay Americans in small towns like Altoona, Pennsylvania, and Richmond, 
Minnesota. And he spoke about wanting to give them hope for a better world, for a better tomorrow, for a nation in which the doors are open to everyone. But he also called upon them to act, to come out, to speak out, to participate in the life of the country as if it were their birthright to do so, which of course it was. I have an original copy of that speech on display in my office. And as the first openly gay American to be elected to the United States Senate, I get plenty of letters from places like Altoona and Richmond. Letters that remind me of the ripple effect, John Lewis, the ripple effect that one's person, one person's journey can create. Letters that remind me of and make clear just how much progress we've made in my lifetime. So while we're all here because of Harvey's courage and conviction, I am well aware that I am literally here because of the progress that he helped make. But you can never declare a civil rights movement to be over. And we have much, much more work to do. If Harvey were here, I can't imagine he'd spend much time admiring his image on the stamp. Not when in so many states it's still legal to fire someone because he or she is gay. And not when gay and lesbian Americans face such significant disparities in health care. And not when so many teenagers can't go to school without being bullied. But we will continue to make progress in our time. Last month, an openly gay man was drafted to the National Football League and celebrated by embracing his boyfriend on national television. Now, sure, we heard from the peanut gallery. <laughs> How am I supposed to explain this to my nine-year-old? But we live in a country where most nine-year-olds could probably explain that kiss <laughs> to their parents. Uh, could probably explain that kiss to their parents without batting an eye. They understand what love is. They understand what fairness is. America is ready to take even more steps forward. But it's going to take more acts of courage and conviction, like the ones made, that made Harvey Milk a hero to all of us and so many countless others. After all, before he was an icon, he was an organizer. And so let us use this moment not to simply celebrate the progress Harvey made in his time, but to redouble our efforts to make progress in our own. When I was a freshman in Congress, I spoke at the Millennium March on Washington. It was back in 2000, probably many of you were there, and I said in my speech, if you dream of a world where you can put your partner's picture on your desk at work, then put your partner's picture on your desk and you will live in such a world. And if you dream of a world in which you can hold your partner's hand while walking down the street, then hold her hand, and you will live in such a world. And by the way, if you dream of a world in which there are more openly gay and lesbian elected officials, then run for office, and you will live in such a world. We all dream of a world in which the promise made in the Declaration of Independence, all men are created equal, is a promise kept to each of our children. So let us keep the promise. Harvey Milk gave us hope, and he showed us how to make the better world we all hope for. So let us be grateful for his courage, but more importantly, let us continue to be inspired by his example. Thank you.
ladies and gentlemen, just give us a second to set up, and I'd like to welcome back to the stage singer-songwriter Mary Lambert. everyone. <laughs> I'm so honored to hear all of those stories. All of your speeches are so touching and inspiring and I'm, I'm so glad to be here.
crying on Sundays I'm not crying today My love, my love, my love, my love oh, She keeps me warm She keeps me warm Thank you so much Our, um, before I introduce our closing speaker, let me just point out that Mary Lambert um, took, uh, I think, a, uh, a very long route to get here, um, but she's going back on a red eye, and uh, it was really just such an honor and privilege that she immediately said yes and, um, uh, and, and provides not just a beautiful, amazing voice, but the heart and soul of a poet. And so please just join me in giving her another round of applause. I was told we're short on time, so make the next introduction very brief. Um, my uncle had named a successor if he should be shot and killed, and the name was Anne Cronenberg. If my uncle had someone to remind him of heart and soul in his campaigns, it was Anne Cronenberg. If there was someone that my uncle believed was a soulmate of his in friendship and in the work of equality, it was Ann Cronenberg. Please join me in welcoming the co-founder of the Harvey Milk Foundation and a wonderful worldwide equality advocate, Ann Cronenberg. Thank you, everyone. It's such an honor to be here today. Um, I'm sure each and every one of you in the audience is jealous you're not up here being the closer after all these incredible speakers we had. <laughs> Believe me, I was thinking as I was sitting here, what else is there to say? I think, I think you'll hear some recurring themes here. And probably the only thing I didn't agree with that was said today, um, and excuse me, Senator Baldwin, but Harvey would have been like so in love with this picture of himself. <laughs> probably would have had it blown up three times the size for his office, but. Each of us should be allowed to follow our own life path. Harvey Milk knew that. He encouraged us to be true to ourselves. Harvey said you must come out of the closet. Be open and honest with your friends. Be open and honest with your family. He gave us permission to be openly gay, to be openly out and proud. He gave us permission to chart our own life course. Harvey instilled hope in all of us, hope for the future, a future where LGBT people would be treated with dignity and respect. He knew before anyone else that to change the attitudes in our society, we had to come out of hiding. Harvey said, and I love this, he said, once they realize that we are indeed their children, that we are indeed everywhere, every myth, every lie, every innuendo will be destroyed once and for all. Harvey's historic message of hope is becoming reality 35 years after his assassination. We see Harvey's legacy in our changing society. Every day, brave men like Michael Sam and brave women like Mary Lambert have the courage to stand up and be proud of who they love. This is declaring your love in a way that back in the 70s, I don't think any of us could have imagined. 
While we've made great strides here in this country, Harvey's mes message still resounds all over the world and we need to do more in other parts of the world. As was said before, one sixth of the world's LGBT population has been recriminalized in the last year because of who they love. That's why the Milk Foundation has been working for half of a decade to support struggling and vulnerable communities around the world. Milk Foundation volunteers work with us using Harvey's story of inspiration in tackling the unique cultural and societal changes and challenges rather that they face daily. Some of these brave men and women traveled far to be with us here today and I thank you so much for joining us. It means a lot to us that you came. It also highlights the fact that the struggle for equality is an indeed a global struggle. Those of us who knew Harvey continue to carry on his message. There are so many people in San Francisco I know would have loved to be here who loved Harvey, who are unable to be. I mean, one person who is here and he has been mentioned a number of times is Danny Nicoletta. And I'm so happy that Danny, it's your image on the postage stamp. And just hearing the things that went on in the front of the camera store during the campaign, I'm sure there would be many raunchy off-color jokes related to the stamp too. But um, you know, it's I, I love the fact that that people of new generations and around the country are going to open their mailbox and see Harvey. I think that's awesome. Last week, I visited Frank Robinson, who's a contemporary of Harvey's and a friend of his, a friend of all of ours. And when I told him about coming here today and the U.S. Post Office and the White House honoring Harvey Milk with the U.S. postage stamp, he looked at me and he said, Annie, look at what we've done. And then he started to cry. And he said, I never thought I'd see this in my lifetime. I wish you could be with us here today, Frank. He is not, not very well, but I hope that you're watching, and I love you, Frank. Stuart was a teenager when his father died, when his um, uncle died. He's picked up Harvey's mantle. He's taken that mantle. He has worked worldwide to spread the image of hope that Harvey gave us and, and equality on a global level. His tireless work overseas as a volunteer leader inspires hope in communities that have little hope. I know Harvey is proud of you, Stuart. I stand here today feeling proud myself that you're continuing to do in his name what he started out. And I'm proud to be here with you today to honor your uncle. No one individual or organization is responsible for the changes that we see today. I believe that it was um, Congressman Lewis who said we started a tidal wave. I really believe that Harvey's actions were a tidal wave and that right now all of us are carrying on his legacy. Harvey talked about inclusion. He talked about all minorities getting together and no longer being the minority, we would be the majority. Straight, gay, young, senior, disabled, people of color, all of us working together, all of us who feel that it's a righteous world and that equality should be the norm and the standard. I too want to thank President Obama and the White House and certainly the United States Postal Service for this incredible honor to be standing here today. I know that Harvey would be so proud. I know he'd be proud of what President Obama has done for the cause. I know that he would be speaking out and would be a leader today as well if he were still with us. I wanna thank the Milk Foundation uh, volunteers, and I know I'll forget people, but um, I'm gonna try. Nicole and Rusty and Justin and Miriam and Julie, and Michelle, and Alan, and again, I'm sure I miss someone, but you know, you guys all work for nothing because you believe and have a passion for the cause. Thank you all for everything you do. I 
I feel my friend Harvey Milk smiling down on us today. His presence is here. I find it a little bit ironic in, in a wonderful way that during his campaign, we didn't have enough money for postage. <laughs> this is a true story. We had one beautiful brochure that we put together, and we couldn't get it out. We relied on our volunteers to hand deliver it to our constituents. So Harvey, here you are today on a United States postage stamp. And I say this is a wonderful thing because you will be there forever. Thank you. So this concludes our speaking program, so we're going to wave goodbye to those of you who are watching the live stream.